get underway. Uh, welcome to North Beach Baptist tonight. Uh, it's great to see you. Um, it's great to see some new faces. It's great to see some old faces. Um, it's great to be here together tonight uh, to worship God and to grow um, in our love for Him. Uh, my name's Michael. Um, together with the music team, we'll be leading you through the service tonight. Um, and tonight we're going to continue in our series uh, titled Deliberate Acts as we follow uh, Paul's second missionary journey uh, in Acts. Um, and, and we've been challenged so far to be reaching out to the people around us with Jesus. And, and we're going to be continue. We're going to continue to be challenged tonight um, once more as we hear of Paul's time in Corinth. Um, tonight is a reasonably full service. Um, we're also going to be hearing um, from Mike Fisher, one of our mission partners, um, hearing what they've been up to and, and what they're going to be up to, um, which is exciting. Um, we're also going to be sharing in communion tonight, um, which is always a privilege to come together and, and remember what Jesus has done for us on the cross. Um, our first song tonight is based on, on this idea as we sing of the love that God has for us. Um, so before we sing, would you please pray with me? Father God, what great love you have shown to us in Jesus' death and resurrection. May we encourage one another tonight to focus our worship on you in our songs, our prayer, our sharing in communion and in life. As we, your people, gather together tonight, may you be greatly praised. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand and sing with us.
Hi everyone. Uh, tonight I have the, the privilege in uh, leading us in communion. Um, and as we come to the Lord's table, um, I'd like to just uh, think about a couple of things of why we find uh, communion important for us at North Beach. Um, why do we set aside time every month to, to repeat a ritual or a, or a, or a tradition that we do um, in the same fashion over and over? Why is it important to us as a congregation? And why is it important to us individually? Um, does taking part in these traditions cause us to be saved or increase our standing before God? Do we become more righteous by taking communion? Uh, the answer is certainly not. Um, Ephesians 2 verse 8 says, uh, For it is grace that we have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is a gift from God. Taking part in communion does not increase our favour with God or earn us salvation through our works. Communion points us to the person whose works have already brought us salvation, the person of Jesus Christ, whose death and resurrection to life has brought us back into relationship with God. Communion is a time of repentance from our sinful ways and reminds us that our works are inadequate to bring us salvation, and so we must trust in Jesus. This is important to keep us as a congregation rooted in the truths of the gospel and to return time and time again to the grace that God has lavished upon us. Is, commun is communion important to us because these emblems are powerful and that they work for our salvation? Do we eat, do we literally eat Christ's body and his blood and drink his blood as described in the scriptures? Certainly not. These emblems are, are relatively normal. We have grape juice and uh, bread or crackers. Um, they do not hold any in inherent power in themselves. They do, however, show the power of Jesus Christ and his victory over sin and death. They signify his body, broken and crushed as atonement for our sins. They signify his blood poured out as a new covenant between us and God. These emblems cause us to remember the truths of the gospel and the powerful work that has been completed by Jesus. Romans 1.16 says that the gospel is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. These em emblems in themselves do not bring us salvation. They merely point to Jesus and what he has done for us. Communion is important to us at North Beach uh, because it points us to the gospel and points us away from ourselves. It reminds us to come to God in repentance and shows the power of Christ and his work in saving us from our rebellion against God. Uh, please join with me as, as we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the reminder of communion. We thank you that we can come to you as a loving Father, free from our sin and rebellion because of what Jesus has done on the cross. We ask that these emblems point our hearts and minds to you, the author of our salvation. May we continue to trust in the promises of the gospel for our good and for your glory. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took the bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I'll now ask everyone to, uh, to, who knows Jesus as Lord and Savior in their life to come up to the tables at the front. Um, we form two lines for the, the two tables that are up here. Uh, take the emblems, the bread and the cup um, back to your seats and use this time to consider what Jesus has done for you on the cross. Consider why it is important in your life and consider how his body was broken for you and his blood poured out as a new covenant. I will ask that you eat the bread in your own time um, and as is the custom here, we'll hold our drinks and we'll drink together um, in a sign of unity. Um, once you finish, the, the cups will be collected. Uh, please come forward and share in communion.
in the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us drink in remembrance of him. I love that we we do the drinking together, um, this sign of unity in the body of Christ. Um, and, and part of that unity is that we do life together. Um, and so we're going to uh, do some announcements now, um, and, it, and it may seem like it kind of clashes a bit with what we've just done. But this is, this is the practical outpouring of that unity as the body of Christ, is we do, we do practical life together. Um, this is the point in our service where the kids uh, go out to their programs. Um, so if there's any kids in the room, now's the time to, to grab your parents and drag them out so that they can sign you in. Um, yeah, we're just going to touch on a few things that are happening around the church at the moment. If you came in the door, which I hope you all did, uh, you should have got a news waves. Um, please have a read of that. There's lots going on in there that I'm not going to touch on. Um, I'm going to leave you to work that out for yourself. Um, but one thing that is in there that is worth uh, speaking about is Easter. Easter is fast approaching. Um, and Easter is such a great time for us to remember what Jesus has done, to focus on his death and the resurrection um, and to also bring others into the church to show them what we believe to tell people about our risen Christ um, and so we have some Easter services happening um, we have uh, some flyers out the back um, and we're doing something a bit new this year with what we call what is a, a Maundy Thursday service. So on Thursday night, uh, come along, there's some details in your news waves, but essentially what it will be is it'll be reading through the scriptures, reading of, of the period before Jesus' death, um, and we're going to show the ever-increasing darkness as that happens uh, with some candles. Um, it'll be a time of reflection and focusing on God's word. So can I encourage you to come along to that and invite people along to that to hear what God has to say about his Saviour King. Um, we also have a couple of services on uh, Good Friday. Uh, so two morning services. There's no evening service on Good Friday. Um, so if you're coming on Good Friday, come at 8.30 or at 10.30. Uh, if you come at 6, there won't be anyone here. Um, so come in the morning on Good Friday, and then on Sunday we have three services again, um, so 8.30, 10.30, and then there is a 6 o'clock service on Sunday. So come along to that, invite people along to that. We're focusing on hope this year. We live in a world that seems hopeless a lot of the time, and so this is a great way to show the hope that we have, to show the people around us uh, where true hope lies. Um, so please come along, please invite someone. Um, the flyers out there aren't for you, they're for you to give to someone. So please grab a flyer um, and, and thoughtfully and prayerfully give it to someone and invite them along. Um, while I'm doing the rest of these announcements, the cups will be collected from communion. So can you pass those to the aisles? Um, and Ashlyn will do that. The other thing that's happening uh, is on, on Saturday, there's a busy bee going on, um, and we traditionally have uh, a quite a poor turnout from Sunday at 6 with these busy bees, um, but it's a great way to, to serve this church community, um, so have a look at that in your news waves, um, and consider whether you can come and 
pull a lead or I don't know what else needs to be done, but Jeff will know. So come and talk to Jeff. Uh, and the other thing that needs to happen is out the back, and I'm told Sunday at 6 has been really good at this, but out the back in the foyer is a copy of the new directory. Um, and we need signatures on that to say that we're allowed to actually publish those details. So even if your details haven't changed from the last directory, and we know and you know that we know that those details are correct, we still need an actual mark on that piece of paper to say that we're allowed to publish that. Um, otherwise, Kay will be ringing you personally um, and you don't want grumpy Kay. So, uh, that is all I'm gonna speak about now. Um, and the next thing we've got happening is we get to hear from one of our mission partners. So I'm gonna invite Mike up. Good looking fellow that he is in his flannels and jeans. And you're gonna take this one. Am I? Uh. <sighs> you just had to reference the flannel, didn't you? The Australian answer to the Peruvian poncho. Um, this is Mike. Hmm. Uh, he's one of our mission partners. Mike, can you tell us, yep. for those that don't know you, hmm. a bit about you and your family? Yeah, so uh, I'm Mike. I'm married to Kerry, who uh, is uh, Grant Hendry's sister. There you go. I didn't realise I was marrying into uh, uh, West Australian royalty when I married Kerry, but I was. So. People always go, oh, we were at your wedding. I go, well, who wasn't? Who wasn't at our wedding? Uh, so, uh, yes, married to Kerry. We've got three daughters. Erin, uh, the eldest, 26. Megan, uh, 24. She's got Down syndrome, so she'll be with us whenever we get to Peru. Hopefully that's sooner rather than later. And um, so she's kind of part of all our planning and considerations as we head to Peru. Uh, then the youngest is Jocelyn, who's... Um, just finished, well, a year or so ago, finished her university and uh, is nursing and is uh, looking for somewhere to do her nursing work. So you uh, just put an advert out there for Jocelyn. Yep. I'm sure she'll appreciate that. Uh, for those of... She won't appreciate me telling everyone she's a redhead. But anyway, keep going. You, you've done it now, anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> for those of us that do know you, mm. we were expecting you to be in Peru. Right? Yeah. Yep. So, what are you doing here, and is there a <laughs> timeline for when you will be in Peru? Uh, look, yeah, we've been, uh, well, I call it kicking the can down the road. We've been kicking the can down the road for a year now, so, you know, the pandemic first hits. We had tickets booked and bought and everything, and then Kerry had started packing suitcases and all that sort of thing, and then this, uh, you know, SIM go, oh, we don't think you're going anywhere for, you know, give it two or three months, okay? And then two or three months later, give another two or three months. Then, oh, we might look at October. Okay, then December. Yeah, sure. Then April, and April doesn't sort of not look like it's going to happen. And then, then we can get our vaccines in May. And then, then a couple of European countries who shall remain nameless went and, because if I name them, someone will just get offended, um, <laughs> went and nicked two shiploads of our vaccines. Ah. Oh last time we helped them out in the World War. So anyway, um, yes, so we don't know when we're getting vaccinated, but as soon as we get that jabber out of here, um, well, then we'll have to find flights. And So it's just, yeah, it's been a bit difficult. Um, I've honestly had my periods of real discouragement about it. I'm just going, oh, what next? Um, but these are the difficulties and hardships and uh, God in his wisdom gives them to us. And but yeah, we feel like we're just hanging around like monkeys a lot of the time, and if we hang around much longer, people will start looking like monkeys. So I, yeah, I don't know. There you are. You asked. I, I did ask. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, you've got a bit of a presentation. Yeah, for I us do. I do about what's going on. I do. Um, so I'll I leave do. that. So to yeah, you. a bit of a refresher and uh, a little update for people. So you're gonna have the first slide up, thanks, and I'll just be. Uh, trying to undo my origami here. So, there we go. So anyway, um, the reason I said half the outrageous things I just did is because my wife Kerry is not with me tonight. Um,
but we've been married for nearly 30 years and we've been doing pastoral ministry uh, uh, here in WA, mostly in Baptist churches for most of that time. So we've been accepted to go to uh, Peru in South America with SIM and uh, um, that's actually the second slide, let's go to the first, there we go, that's better. Um, uh, so an SIM stands for Serving in Mission, it's an interdenominational mission, it's pretty big, uh, it's got about 4,000 missionaries in 70 countries around the world, it's a, merged a whole lot of you know, African missions and missions in South America over the years, just merged into SIM, so it's a pretty big outfit and I think it's really cool. Uh, and its aim is simply this, to make disciples of Jesus Christ in communities where he is least known. So that's the idea. So next slide, thanks. So back in uh, 89, um, Kerry joined SIM. It was before Kerry and I were married and she worked in Pakistan for two years at Murray Christian School. Some of you might have heard of that, uh, School for Missionary Children. But anyway, here we are, nearly 30 years later, um, stepping out to go to Peru with SIM and, and with God. Uh, Peru is a, a country that's been um, on our hearts for a long time. Uh, it's mostly a Catholic country. Uh, the Spanish uh, discovered it and uh, invaded back in the 1500s. They overthrew the Inca Empire. And so the official language of Peru is Spanish. But the Quechua Indians, who are the, the descendants of the Inca, they, of course, speak Quechua, which is the old Ingl Inca language. And uh, they, mostly in the rural areas, in the Andes, so the more remote you go, the less Spanish you get, and the more Quechua, and there are other tribal languages in Peru as well. Uh, since the 1950s, evangelical churches have been planted and are spreading even into the more remote areas, but these churches have got a critical need for trained and equipped leaders. So a bit of geography about South America, next slide, there we go, there's the, the place. It's divided by the Andes Mountains there, that sort of brown and white bit running up the middle, uh, north-south. Um, along the west coast, along the Pacific, it's, it's dry as a chip. Uh, not even lichen grows. Oh, trust me, I've looked. There's nothing. Nothing grows. Um, it might rain once every 20 years. Uh, then some plants grow, but apart from that, it's just, there's nothing. So cities like Lima, which is on the uh, centre of the coast there, the Peru get all their water from uh, rivers that come down from the Andes. So the the river that, that feeds Lima is called the Remac. Uh, that doesn't even make it to the sea anymore because all of the water gets diverted off for the needs of the city and everything like that. On the other side of the Andes, you've got the Amazon Basin, which is um, lush and uh, jungle and lots of rivers and lots of rain. So what that doesn't get on the western side gets on the eastern side. And up the middle, you've got the Andes Mountains and the, it's like a high mountain plain called the Altiplano. Um, gets up, that gets up to about 5,000 metres. Then you've got mountains that sort of come up out of that and, and get, get even higher, um, up to nearly 8,000 metres. So it's quite, quite something. Um, uh, when we get to Peru, we'll be living in the city of Arequipa, which is marked on the map there. That's in the southern Andes. That's about the same elevation as Kosciuszko here. So that's 2,300 metres. So yeah, when you get to Arequipa, you do spend the first month or so huffing and puffing as you walk up steps and all that sort of thing. Um, we, 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 uh, we're planning that Arequipa will be the base from which we want to do our work in more outlying areas. Um, of course, everyone's been asking us, when are you leaving for Peru? Um, the answer I gave before is uh, the one, uh, as soon as we get that jab, we're out of here. Um, we do want to say thank you to you as a church for are standing with us. It's just a bit of a trying and at times frustrating time for everyone involved in missions. I mean, there are missionaries who are back here on home assignment and they're just stuck on home assignment. There are missionaries still overseas who would like to get back to Australia but can't and there were well, there are plenty of uh, missionaries like us who are just all set to go and then just everything sort of froze. So, so thanks for standing with us in our proposed ministry in Peru. C keep on praying with us that God would remove the obstacles in his time, that we'd be patient. I've been really, to be honest, struggling with that patience bit, but uh, we need to be patient. We need to trust in God's time and we need to um, uh, remain faithful and, and make the most of this time. Uh, no time is wasted. God is the ultimate um, multitasker 
and uh, he's got everything sorted. So we need to keep trusting in him and keep working towards uh, that goal of getting to Peru. Um, I've been doing uh, language lessons online with uh, my uh, language tutor in Peru via Skype. So we do that five days a week. So we are trying to make the most of the time that we have um, and pray that we'll keep on doing that. Uh, so next slide, thanks. Uh, um, for the first year, our main focus is going to be on learning Spanish. Uh, even though I've been learning Spanish here, it is kind of slow because I just do it for a few hours each day and then the rest of my day is in Spanish. And, uh, you know, and when, when there's a weekend and I don't have any classes for a couple of days, I get back on the, the Monday and, uh, yeah, I've gone back two steps already in the Spanish and make all these mistakes and leave us goes, it's okay, buddy, you had the weekend, you know. <laughs> it's, just, it's, it's hard work. So we, 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 we're we looking forward to getting there to learning Spanish and, and attending a local church there as well as getting to know the other SIM missionaries in, in Arequipa. The other thing we'll be doing... Uh, God willing, during our first year there, we'll be uh, looking more into ways to help train and equip Quechua church leaders uh, in their Bible teaching and in their work in their communities. And this is because uh, for many church leaders, getting Bible training is just about impossible. Um, many have got small farms and families to care for. They work seven days a week. Even uh, taking time off to go to church is a big sacrifice for them because everything's geared around working seven days a week just to make enough to get by. Uh, so they've got little money to spare. They live in remote places where travel is difficult and slow. Um, mule is still the best way to go in many places because there aren't many petrol stations out there. So uh, this is the way people live. And so obtaining the... There are uh, Bible colleges in the main cities, Arequipa and Lima especially, but if you can't leave your farm or your family, you can't afford to go there, you can't take the time off to do that, how will you get trained? Um, so we want to find ways of taking Bible training to them. Perhaps we'll end up using a combination of online materials and short Bible courses taken in different locations, maybe getting um, uh, course materials to them via mobile phone technology or correspondence. We'll see how things unfold. But at the end of the day, there is no substitute for uh, visiting, discipling and, and personally encouraging these hard-working Quechua pastors. Uh, next slide, thanks. So we can't do this alone. We'd love you to be uh, partners with us. Uh, your church has been partnering with us uh, wonderfully. Uh, if you don't receive our newsletter, uh, I've got a, there's a table out there in the foyer and uh, you can just sign up for that. Please write clearly. I, I'm not great at deciphering uh, hieroglyphics that sometimes people use. Um, so if, please write clearly or even better, we've got a, here's a, here's a prayer card. We've got our prayer cards, grab one of those, stick in our fridge. But best of all, it's got a little QR code on it there. You can scan that, it takes you to a sign-up page for our newsletter, and that's the easiest way to do it. But look, in, ever, in whatever way uh, you can uh, best support us, uh, please join us uh, in just helping establish the gospel in the Andes of southern Peru. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Thanks so much, Mike. Uh, that's really encouraging to hear. Um, and we, yeah, our prayers are certainly with you, and uh, we hope you get there as soon as you can. Uh, that's really encouraging. We're going to sing about uh, sing about God's love and how we can hopefully spread that here and around the world. So please stand with us as we sing.
Please pray with me. God, you are amazing. You are all powerful, all knowing. You created the heavens and the earth, and you created us. And Lord, you created us to be in relationship with you. And yet we blew it. Lord, we reject you as king and place ourselves on that throne. And yet instead of punishing us as you should, you sent Jesus to die in our place. To pay the penalty for sin that we deserved, Lord. And Lord, you raised Jesus from the dead in victory over death, and you placed him at your right hand, seated on the throne, to rule and to judge. And because of that, we have hope. We have security in the knowledge that the rightful king is on the throne and that we are included in his kingdom. But we pray for all those around the world who are also part of this same kingdom. We especially pray for the fishers as they go and, and prepare to go to Peru to help train our brothers in Christ. To give them assurance of the hope that they already have and to give them the skills to train and disciple those you have entrusted to them. That we pray for a vaccine soon so that Mike and Kerry and Megan can go and serve you in Peru. And Lord, we pray for ourselves as well. We pray for continued 
opportunities to share the gospel with those around us. We continue to pray for those in desperate need of hope. Lord, each of us has been praying for someone in our lives. We pray that you would continue to give opportunity to speak of Jesus, the one that we all truly need. Lord, there are also many amongst us who are suffering. Suffering from illness, facing grief facing persecution and rejection either in workplaces from family as they study from friends Lord may you strengthen each one of us in the knowledge that you are in control and you are above all things And Lord, I thank you that we have access to you. I thank you that through Jesus' death and resurrection, we can talk to you freely and know that you hear us. Lord, hear our prayer tonight. Amen. We're now going to have the Bible reading from Mo. Tonight's reading is Acts 18, verses 1 to 17. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. He found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome. And he came to them. So, because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for by occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. For when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to him, them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. And he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justice, one who worshipped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household, and many of the Corinthians, hearing and believed, were baptized. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by vision, Do not be afraid, but speak, and do not keep silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. And he continued there for a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. When Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, This fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O Jews, there would be reason why I should bear with you. But if it is a question of words and names in your own law, look to it yourselves, for I do not want to be a judge of such matters. And he drove them out from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks took Sothenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. But Gallio took no notice of these things. Thanks, Mo. Let's come before God. Let's pray. Father, as we've just heard your word read, we ask and pray that you, by your spirit, work in us to fulfill your great and good purposes. You're here to challenge and encourage us and spur us on. Uh, May we be receptive to all of your work. We pray this in your precious name. Amen. Well, last week, there was a very loud screech in the Hendry household. And it was that kind of screech that couldn't be ignored. Now, to be honest, I did actually try to ignore it for a while, um, but I only bought myself a couple of seconds because 
it was obvious that it was a urgent summons to deal with nothing less than a genuine monster-sized cockroach. A wild beast. I think the photo behind you is actually a real size of it, at least from the screech it was a bit like that. Um, a wild beast with far too many peers in our neck of the woods. Now, we all know something about cockroaches. We know that they're virtually indestructible. You know, you squash them, they might only have two legs left and yet they still crawl away with quite some speed. You spray them and they sort of say thank you and, uh, for the refreshment and, and still disappear looking quite healthy. Some, sometimes I've, I've even popped what I think is a thoroughly dead and squashed and sprayed cockroach in the bin and hours later I hear it sort of feasting, a gourmet feast in my bin. Does any of that mesh with your experience of cockroaches? Please excuse me for the comparison that I'm about to make, which all sorts of ways is, is not a good one. However, there is one area where it is good. I can't think of any more resilient creature than a cockroach other than the Apostle Paul. That's my analogy. I mean, we read in Acts, we see that Paul has seemingly an unsurpassed capacity to persevere in the midst of extreme opposition. So over the past six weeks, we've been working through this middle part of Acts and, and hearing the times that Paul is, is flogged, is imprisoned, is all sorts of weird things happen. There's times that he's even been left for dead. That's how, how, how much damage has been done to him. And yet he gets up and he keeps on going and he keeps on going back into situations that are so incredibly dangerous. Acts 18, our reading today, is yet another restart. Why is it a restart? Because he's been booted out of place after place after place. So we've seen Thessalonica, we've seen Berea, Athens. And, and now we come to Corinth. Paul arrives in Corinth as an impressive but a notoriously immoral city. He goes there to evangelize, not to recuperate, not to rest. Corinth, it was a strategic place. It was built on a narrow strip of land. It's just seven kilometers across from two seas. You can see on the map behind me that there's a whole trading area and another whole trading area, this little neck of land, and Corinth is right there. Such a strategic place. It made it into a very busy, a very rich, a very famous and prosperous area. Might have even been full of tourists, but certainly full of traders, and, and it was a significant part of the world. Virtually all the people that were there were also sex crazed. Because in an empire that was noted for immorality, this place of Corinth, as many port cities are, and this is like a double port city, so double the reason, Corinth was particularly famed for immorality. You know, some would have seen Corinth as a place to avoid. You know, perhaps to pass through and go somewhere else. Whereas it might have been a bit easier. You know, a bit more level playing field for the gospel, you might think. More fertile ground for the gospel, no pun intended. Paul eagerly headed to Corinth, though, intentionally, to plant a church. Because he's compelled to share the good news of Jesus with people that haven't heard. He knows that Corinth is full of people that haven't heard the gospel. He's fully aware that Corinth is at this junction and so the gospel can disseminate from there throughout the ancient world. Amazingly, when Paul arrives to Corinth, at Corinth, he's met by a Christian couple. I think would have been surprised to, to find this Christian couple there, but they're a couple that have only just arrived. Aquila and Priscilla. They've arrived, they've set up a business, a tent-making business of all things. I say of all things because the Apostle Paul was a tent maker. That was his trade. They'd recently been expelled, we heard in our Bible reading from Rome, along with all of the Jews that the, uh, the uh, Caesar of the day had, had, had got rid of the Jews, they'd misbehaved or got a bit too excited or whatever else, so they were all booted out into different places and, and two of them ended up in Corinth. And the two that were there, Priscilla and Aquila, clearly were Christians. And can you imagine Paul's excitement? Excitement, there's already some Christians here, just two, but there's two here, and they're tent makers. And so Paul sets up in business with them or joins their business, 
by day he's working as a tent maker with Priscilla and Aquila. Why? To pay the bills, to eat, to, 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 to pay his way. And then partners by, by weekend, by Saturday, partners in the gospel to make followers of Jesus. To, de- to evangelize and to, and to build a church in Corinth. And so they, there they are, week after week, evangelizing, telling, reasoning, trying to persuade the Jews that Jesus is their long-awaited Messiah. And non-Jews as well, that the Messiah of the Old Testament is actually a Messiah for all people. So, so Paul's pouring his heart into what he's truly there for as an evangelist. And because he was tent making by day, by weekday, that's where we get the term tent maker missionary from, or tent maker pastor. Missionaries or, or pastors who are in place in a certain area for the sole purpose of evangelism and church planting and, and discipleship. That's the reason for them being there. However, they're, they're financially supporting themselves, so they're working by day and evangelizing in spare time or other time. So the term tent maker, missionary or pastor doesn't mean that they live in a tent or that they make tents, but simply that they're supporting themselves. Why did Paul do this? Well, you can think there's practical reasons he needed to eat, and he, and he did. But he didn't do it in other places. He hadn't done it in, in, in Berea, for example, or Thessalonica, or Athens. Well, in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 18, we're told exactly why he did it in Corinth. Even though Paul is strong that missionaries and ministers of the gospel deserve a wage he doesn't want the Corinthians in particular to be waylaid by asking them for any financial support why? well as with many affluent places as Corinth was an affluent place there's this, there's this thing with money and so many come to associate uh, money as as, as as, as, a, as a God and, and, and people would come through Corinth as speakers, as motivational speakers and they'd, and they'd put out their hand for, for money. Paul wanted to distance himself. He doesn't want to peddle the gospel in any way. He wants to proclaim the gospel and his intent, he understands the most effective way for this not to get diluted, not to get misplaced in the, in the marketplace of, of people peddling all sorts of philosophies was that he needed to do it free. So he's working in order to pay the bills and evangelize them. In verse 5, though, we're told that Silas and Timothy rejoin him. They'd been partners with him earlier. They rejoin him from Berea and that Paul then ditches tent-making and focuses on evangelism and discipleship full-time. And you might think, oh, right, great. You know, the church has had, had this head start now and there's many people who have caught it. They, they know what Christianity is really about and, and now they're prepared to finance Paul as he keeps on evangelizing. No. Paul's friends came with a gift, a generous gift. From who? Well, from the churches that had just been planted just, just weeks earlier, literally, in Philippi and the like. They had generously given to to finance the ministry there in Corinth. And so Paul's now able to pour all of his time into his whole reason for existence, evangelism and discipleship of new Christians, testifying to the Jews that Jesus is their Messiah, their long-promised God dwelling amongst them, but crucified to deal with the sin of all who trust in him, risen and ruling as king of the universe. That was Paul's message. And he spent every moment he had proclaiming, explaining, reasoning with people. But then, deja vu. His Jewish audience, by and large, say, enough. They're not going to have a bar of this. They oppose him violently. They abuse him. They chase him from the synagogue. And Paul leaves and he says, your blood be upon your own shoulders solemn, isn't it? Paul knew rejecting the good news about Jesus it meant turning their back on eternal life. It is a solemn thing. It is a dreadful thing. Jesus is not an added extra to life. He's the giver of life. 
May none of us turn our back upon Jesus or turn our back upon telling others to, to, to come and trust in the Lord Jesus. So Paul is totally rejected by the Jews. But you know what? He doesn't miss a beat. He goes right next door to the house of the Gentile, Titus Justus, and he continues preaching about Jesus. He's not going to be stopped by opposition. And, and don't miss this astonishing little detail in verse 8. Somebody goes with him. In the, in the midst of, of all of the abuse and the, and the name-calling as Paul is booted out of the synagogue, as all of this is happening, Crispus, the synagogue ruler, no less, quietly packs up his things and walks out with Paul. And not just him, his whole family. Did you get that? The boss of the synagogue has just heard what Paul's been saying. He's heard it, and it rings true. And instantly, in, in spite of the heckling, in spite of the enormous social consequences and the financial consequences, everything on the line, in spite of that, Crispus becomes jobless and despised. He is in his whole family head next door with Paul because they understand the supreme importance of trusting in the Messiah, the Jesus that Paul spoke to them about. They've given up everything in the world's eyes, but you know what? They gave up nothing in relation to what counts. They found peace with God. You may sometimes think the days of Christianity in our world are numbered. I mean, maybe you think that, that spiritually hard places like 21st century Australia, there's no way anybody's going to turn 180 degrees from, from following the ways of the world to following Jesus of all things. The gap's just too great now. I mean, perhaps years gone by that was okay. And, and to back up that sort of reasoning, you know, you see the statistics and you read in the, in the media about churches shrinking and, and loss of influence and, and you feel the cost, don't you feel the cost? At the office, at school, at uni, on social media? How, how much worse for, for Crispus, the ex-synagogue leader? Imagine how much he felt the loss and the cost. However, when the gospel is communicated, no matter how tough the context, you know, some people will come to understand and they will turn 180 degrees and follow Jesus. It's how it's always been, it's how it always will be until Jesus returns. And it's worth it. It's so much worth it because we're dealing with eternal life. There's nothing more important. I was just listening as I was driving around. I was listening last week um, on the radio uh, about the world's richest diamond mine, which, in case you didn't know it, is Lake Argyle Mine, so here in WA. And it just closed a couple of months ago. But I think it was going for about 37 years, and, and I think it, they said it, described it that way, the world's richest diamond mine. Do you know that on average, over that whole life of the mine, one gram of diamonds required 1,000 kilograms of rock to be crushed. Now, crushing rock takes a lot of energy, a lot of effort, a lot of cost. And we're not talking about just crushing any rock. We're talking about the, the, the richest determined ore for, for diamonds, the, the carefully extracted pieces of rock, 1,000 kilograms per one gram. And yet, it was worth the effort. The product was that valuable. Do you know the value of eternal life is infinitely greater than a truckload of pure pink diamonds? Yes, Paul was flogged and chained and ridiculed time and time again, but he knew it was worth it. You think it's tough? being a Christian in the 21st century in Perth? I do. And Paul felt the pain. He felt the challenge where he was in Corinth. In fact, wherever he was, he felt it. And we actually really know that in 1 Corinthians 2. So this is a letter that Paul writes back to this very church that he founds in Corinth. He says, I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. Why? Well, clearly he didn't relish being clobbered. Not many do. He didn't relish being ridiculed. Not many do. He certainly didn't. 
and yet he still went. Because being clobbered and ridiculed, well, that's, that's a small price. That's a, that's a price worth paying in order that some would become Christians. Paul knew that lots wouldn't, but he knew that some would, and he went. You know, as I reflect on this, I want to, I want to say there's four ripper reasons for us to tell people about Jesus. And not only is Paul reflecting this, but, but these are absolutely dead set true for us as well. First of all, to give glory to God. I think these are in order, these four reasons. And, and as creator of the universe, God deserves our worship and our honor. It's a travesty. There's something dreadfully wrong if, if the creator doesn't worship the creator. May we reveal the greatness of the Lord Jesus to give glory to God, firstly. Secondly, out of obedience to God. Jesus himself says, go into all of the world, make disciples of all nations, baptizing, teaching, training, founding the church, growing the church. Go into all of the world to do that. So it's, a, it's, a, it's evangelism and mission work, evangelism to the ends of the earth. It's out of obedience to God. And thirdly, it's out of love for people because every single person is exceedingly precious. I mean, exceedingly. When God has made us eternal beings, we're not, this is not just something temporal like, like gold or silver or diamonds. Souls changed eternally. Out of love of people, may we communicate how people can be right with God. There is nothing more important than that. It's an extremely selfish reason to think, well, yeah, that might motivate me to, to, to talk about Jesus to my, to my family or to my closest friends. And, and that's good that it does that, but, but you know what? It's, there's something very selfish if it doesn't also motivate us to tell people that even don't know Jesus at the moment. People in, in Peru, people in, in any part of the world where there's very little Christian witness, where we don't know the people at this point, but, but to go and, and God is calling and equipping people even here to go to far-flung places not just Mike others may we may the love of people propel us forward in this world and fourthly I think the fourth reason trusting in the Lord Jesus wonderfully connects us deeply with people who serve the King of Kings and so out of the desire to give glory to God, out of the desire to heed the word of God, the truth, the commands of God, out of the desire of loving people and, and, and also of, of even enjoying the blessing of being connected with people on track with us to eternity. These things propel us forward to talk about Jesus, no matter what the cost. That's what Paul kept on doing. That's what he wouldn't be stopped from doing, even though it continually got him clobbered and ridiculed. In Corinth, something then unexpected happened to Paul. Paul receives a direct message from Jesus, a word of encouragement, a spurring on. This all came in a very clear vision, and you can see it there in verse 9. Don't be afraid, Paul, Jesus says. Why? Why, why did Jesus speak to Paul like this? How often did Jesus do that? We don't know exactly how often, but we actually can pretty confidently work out. It wasn't very frequent. It wasn't often at all. Paul got on with it. He just kept on going to strategic places. He just kept on doing the same thing, following the same formula, going and talking to Jews first because they had the Old Testament, they had the Messiah expectation, and then going to Gentiles and, and revealing to them and building churches mainly of Gentiles. And, and he just kept, he just followed this formula. But every now and then, God himself intervenes and just gives a direction or some particular encouragement. And this time, that's what it was. Don't be afraid, Paul, Jesus says. Keep speaking, Paul, for I'm with you. And nobody's going to attack you and harm you because I have many people in this city. This is a powerful and a specific message. As God's saying, you might be feeling especially weak and vulnerable and scared, but you know what, Paul? I'm bigger than all of the opposition that you've ever faced, that you ever could face. I'm bigger. I've got it sorted. I'm, I'm, I'm going to sustain you. And, I'm, and by the way, you're not going to face that opposition here. 
I, I've got lots of fruitful work for you, Paul, and you're able to, to stay. You're able to do that fruitful work of planting this church here and really founding and, and grounding this church here. Perhaps Jesus also said, um, look, look at Crispus, or perhaps Paul just didn't think back, yeah, Crispus and his whole family, and, and others as well that had already come to faith in him. And Paul, I've got many people here in Corinth tell them tell them about me nobody's going to bash you up this time Paul every, every bit of that is a, is a super encouraging mes- message that came to Paul by this vision now to be clear God has always spoken in multiple different ways including visions in fact visions in the Old Testament were quite common and they're not so common in the New Testament because we have the cross of Christ to look at. We have the definitive expression, God himself dwelling amongst us. And, and God promises to use his word, the scriptures, to teach us, to train us, to, 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 to encourage us, to spur us on. So, so God doesn't promise to personally speak to us in visions but he promises to speak to us in the scriptures and, and whenever he chooses, he can, he can use visions and all sorts of things. But, but may our focus be like Paul's was, focus on God's truth and in reasoning and in, in encouraging people with the, with the word of God. And when Paul was specially spoken to by Jesus, Paul listened, he heeded, and it propelled him forward to keep on doing what he was doing. God wasn't saying, Paul, you're never going to face opposition again. He's just saying, in Corinth, you're not going to face any opposition here. Nothing, you're not going to be hurt this time, Paul. Which, in effect, is saying, Paul, your adrenaline and your cortisol levels, they've been up a bit high for a long time now. I'm going to let them just tone down, stabilize, normalize. No matter what murderous threats you hear, and undoubtedly you heard these threats. In fact, we're going to, we're going to read about one in a few moments. No matter what threats you hear, you're as safe as a joey in the mother's pouch a long, long way away from any road. You're nice and safe there. You're not going to be touched by anyone. You're going to be provided, protected. You're going to be, you're going to be able to get on with your job just like your heart's desire. And it would have been such an encouragement to Paul. I mean, as we said earlier, he was, he was fearful. There was, there was discouragement and now he's, now he's got this bounce in his step. He knows his safety. And, and what about this? When Jesus says to him, I've got many people here. Can you imagine his heart leaping through the roof? I've got, I've got many people here, Jesus has said. Many people. How exciting. He's, actually, what a time warp. How can that be? How can Jesus say to Paul, I've got many people here, which is an indication I've got many more people for you to tell the gospel that I know are going to turn to me and trust me as Lord and Saviour. I mean, I mean, this is a difficult doctrine to get our head around. How can it be that Jesus can say, I'm going to cause your message to be effective in other people's lives, even though they haven't heard the truth at this point? Can you see what's happening here? This is, this is who Jesus is. He, is. he is God who's going to actively soften hearts as his word is proclaimed. Jesus, God himself is always in the driver's seat. Nobody becomes a Christian. Nobody trusts in Lord, the Lord Jesus without God himself doing the work to soften hearts. Can you see this, these two things? There's the proclamation of the truth. That's what Paul did. That's what we're called to do. And there's the the hard bit that God does, which is softening the heart so that the truth that is proclaimed is going to take root. And, and if that doesn't happen, if Jesus doesn't, if God doesn't do his bit, then it's just going to bounce off hard hearts. But our job is to tell. May we not stop from doing our job. And, and Paul is being told here so clearly that people who haven't even heard yet are going to have soft hearts because God's going to do that hard work of changing people. Do you think that God has many people in this city of Perth? People who are ready to hear the gospel, that God is softening their hearts right at the moment? Do you think that's true? I do. 
And I think that's, I think that's true because that's how God works. He calls people. He works in people. He uses us. He's always in the driver's seat himself, though, but he uses us as weak as we are. Our job is just to, is just to keep on talking, talking to our friends, listening to their questions, seeking to engage with their questions. We've got to go dig in the Scriptures ourselves to answer their questions at times and, and, and to hold out the offer of eternal life, hope, peace. To lend people a book, a, a right book, a good book for what, where they're at at the moment. To invite people to a meal. A meal where you're prayerfully seeking to engage with them. You're doing your utmost to engage with spiritual matters. You know, that's our role. There's many facets to our role, but it's all part of telling people about Jesus. And they're all the easy things. Because the hard thing is to soften the hardened heart. And God's got all of the results covered. It's a super encouraging thing to think about. Scattered amongst the negative responses in Corinth that Paul had already received and was going to receive, and let's face it, most of the responses were always going to be negative, as indeed it is now, because Jesus talks about the way to eternal life being a narrow path, a narrow gate, a small gate. Wide is the gate that leads to destruction, but narrow is the gate that leads to peace with God. But there's always going to be people who go through that gate as you and I tell them about Jesus. So the same is true for Corinth and for us. Whenever the gospel is proclaimed, some will trust in the Lord Jesus. Much later, when Paul looked back on the church in Corinth and he wrote to the church that he founded in Corinth, he talked about the Jews wanting proof the Greeks wanting deep philosophy, but ultimately the simple gospel will keep on doing its work no matter what the reason people have for not wanting to engage with it. This is how, how Paul puts it exactly in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 22 and 23. Jews demand signs. Greeks look for wisdom. This is like a national characteristic kind of desires here. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, can you see what he's talking about here? To, to those whom God has softened their hearts and those that God's going to work in and is working in, to those that God has called, both Jews and Greeks, there's no barriers, no ethnic barriers that's going to happen to people, all peoples, all nations. To those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God, well, it's stronger than human strength. For every single person here who already trusts Jesus, and that's many, that's how it worked, and that's how it goes on working. In spite of the fact that Jesus was crucified, in spite of the fact that he was humiliated, in spite of the fact that, that he, he keeps on talking about terrible, difficult things like forgiveness and, and commands us, his followers, to forgive and to, and to love even our enemies and, and the challenging things of character, that we're to be people whose character becomes like Jesus, the fruit of the Spirit, despite all those challenging things, we've taken a step to trust in Jesus. If we're here as a follower of Jesus, we've taken that step and God's still going to use us to help others to make that step too because God works in that way. May we not give up telling others about Jesus. Don't look at the obstacles or the pain. Don't be silenced. Don't look at the media reports that say that, it's a, there's, that the church is dead. Look at Jesus and obey and love him and help others to worship him. And as we watch how things play out in Corinth, we can see Jesus keeping his promise and many, many are added to the kingdom as Paul ministers in, in Corinth. In verse 11, it tells us that Paul stays there for 18 months. as a whopping year and a half, teaching the word of God, a PB for Paul. 18 months in one place. Not a single clobbering. Don't think it's ever happened before. Sure, the Jews do drag him in front of Gallio, the local governor. We read about that in verse 12. 
Paul could have thought, ah, oh, here we go again. It took a while, but now it's come. Why would he think that? Well, whenever he's been taken before a governor before or an equivalent kind of Roman appointed role before, do you know what's happened every single time up to that point? He's been put in prison. He's been flogged. He's been persecuted severely. And so you could think, ah, oh, okay. No, he didn't think that. Jesus had told him that's not going to happen. And I reckon he would have been on the edge of the seat saying, I've got no idea, absolutely no idea what God's going to do here. But I just know I'm not going to be hurt. And I reckon he would have been almost in a third person objective, sort of, let's watch and let's see. And I still don't think he would have guessed what would have happened. This is what happened. It's astounding. Just as Paul was about to speak, verse 14, Gallio said to them, if you Jews were making a complaint about some misdemeanor or serious crime, it would be reasonable for you to come to me. But since it involves questions about words and names of your own law, settle the matter yourselves. I will not be a judge of such things. It was unheard of. You know, these Roman appointed people, they just, they just flogged people for the sake of it, even if it was just to teach somebody a lesson, just in case they might have been causing some disruption. Gallio is saying, you're wasting my time. You're complaining to the wrong person. Talk to somebody who cares. Be a bit like if, if I went to the police station and I said, my son isn't obeying me. Now, there's times I've been tempted to do that. <laughs> do you know what a kind police officer would say to me? He'd say, I'm really sad to hear that, sir. I think you need to sit down and talk to him a bit more. I think you need to perhaps talk to some of his friends and parents of friends. I think you might need to go to a, you know, read a few good books or go to a few seminars or get some friends to support you and help you. I, you know, but, but I'm sorry, I can't help you. I think you just need to... Do you know what a less kind police officer would say? Stop wasting my time. Buzz off. It's nothing to do with me. Wrong place. In effect... Gallio is responding like the less kind police officer. Even though other Roman officials had responded in a radically different way, even though Pilate had responded in a radically different way, even to Jesus, Gallio drove them off. Stop wasting my time. Buzz off. I can't care less about your petty internal skirmishes. Buzz off. Let me drink my wine in peace. But that's not the end of it. What happens next is another shock. Verse 17, then the crowd turned on Sothenes, the synagogue ruler. Don't forget, this is the replacement ruler because the first one had become a Christian. And so this new dude in the job gets bashed. Presumably, he was the spokesperson and went to Gallio and said, hey, you intervene. And, and Sothenes wasn't good enough at his job, apparently. And, and so they turn on him. I mean, there's a whole lot of things we don't know. We do hear of a Sothenes who became a Christian later, so perhaps the bashing caused him to become... I don't know what was happening here, but, but in effect, the crowd are so angry, they irrationally beat Sothenes. And Gallio shows no concern whatsoever. He's got no regard for law and order, even though that happens to be his job. So he won't not do his job. He won't do something beyond his job, but he won't even do his job as well. So back to my earlier illustration. If I drag my daughter to the cop shop, I complain that he's, he's not doing the right thing in my sight. The cop would say, not my problem. But if I then bash up my wife in the presence of the police officer, I'm pretty confident they would arrest me. I'm pretty confident they'd say, stop because their issue would be with my conduct and their job would be to stop me and to charge me. Gallio, no, just interested in eating his sushi in peace, revealing not only would he not interfere beyond his authority, he couldn't even be bothered to live up to his job description. But even so, can you see what the big point is here? The truth of the vision, especially given to Paul, at all odds stood firm. Paul absolutely safe and able to proclaim the truth with joy. Do you ever feel dis dispirited and discouraged? 
Do you feel the spiritual apathy around you? The hostility? Do you feel the growing hostility? Are you tired of standing out as a Christian, copying the flack of being a Christian? Are you tired of not being effective because most people that you proclaim or reveal the gospel to aren't interested? Have you tried time and time again to be a faithful witness but you've had no results so you've given up? We do live in a world that is steadily pushing back against the gospel. But we also live in a world where Jesus still has his hands on the wheel, where he's still supremely in control and he's, he's still a saviour of the world. All who trust in him, he's still up to the job of saving people and he still uses weak people like Paul and like me and like you to, to, to communicate the importance of trusting in Jesus. We get the easy job, talking. God gets the hard job, softening hearts. Let's not pike out of the easy job that we've been given, but instead, let's pray. Why do we pray? We pray because God's in the driver's seat of softening hearts. So, so we pray, not only out of obedience to God, but we pray because God's got to do the work around us. Otherwise, we speak in futile. It's futile. Let's pray. But let's tell. Let's tell people about Jesus. Not just living a good life. Although, let's do that as well. Let's show people what faith is like by how we live, by what we value, by how we conduct ourselves. Let's show and tell people. Let's persevere with revealing the truth. And let's expect with confidence that some, some people that we know that are not yet followers of Jesus because we tell them about Jesus and because we live a life in accordance with, in, in accord with the truth we believe, that they will become followers of the Lord Jesus and will spend eternity together with them. And they'll be eternally grateful to you and me, whoever has shared the gospel with them. Friends, let's pray, tell, show, persevere and expect with confidence that God will build his church using us. That's us telling God softening and the church growing. Let's, let's pray right now that God helps us and, and let's pray that we go forth here with an expectation even this week that God's great and glorious kingdom will be furthered through you and me. Let's pray. Father God, as we've gathered tonight with joy to sing your praises, to celebrate the Lord's Supper together, to hear of the spread of the gospel, into faraway places, even Peru. To hear your word, your word written so many years ago and so many, so many amazing things. That's why we come tonight, to engage, to feed upon your word, to encourage one another and to be spurred on. And we now seek boldness, strength, perseverance as we go forth from here to, to tell people to show people, to persevere and to expect people to come to trust you as Saviour and Lord. Please, please encourage us and spur us on. Just like you, you knew how to encourage Paul at time of need and you've given us your word to encourage us and your spirit is active in, in, in everyone who trusts you as Saviour and Lord. And we come before you to dedicate ourselves as, as your servants to spread your kingdom. And Father, I pray for any, any here that are that have heard this message perhaps with bemusement because they're not yet followers of Jesus, to, that you will soften their hearts and that, that we will be united as, as one who are at peace with you forever and as commissioned by you to spread your kingdom forever, your great, glorious, eternal kingdom. We pray these things in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much, Grant. Uh, let's sing about our God's love for us uh, to conclude our service. Please stand.
Amen to that. Isn't God amazing? And um, we've been told tonight of God's work through Paul and his call to us to go and tell people about Jesus. We've got the easy job. God has the hard job of softening hearts. Will you trust him to do his work? Will you step out in faith and do yours? Uh, tonight we have lots of new faces, which is great to see, and we're gr very glad that you're here joining us tonight, and we, we hope that you will come back and continue to worship with us. Um, if you're a regular, can I put the challenge on you to go and talk to someone that you don't know? Don't assume that someone's been here before. Even if you end up talking to another regular that you've never met before, what a great thing it is to meet fellow believers, fellow sharers in the gospel, uh, go in peace. <laughs> 